great to be here. So it would not be a San Francisco slash Silicon Valley technology conference without a panel of investors. But, and, and I don't think, as far as I know, that there has been um, a gathering, uh, a panel where, where the usual suspects are up on stage, the, the usual Sand Hill Road investors. Uh, this time, Holly was careful to kind of change things up, I think, by recruiting some folks who are, yes, doing healthcare investing, but doing it from different kinds of organizations and maybe with slightly different agendas and hopes and histories and passions and backgrounds. So that's what today's panel is about. Um, I want to, again, uh, kind of reintroduce each of the panelists and tell you their formal titles. So um, Mustakim Siddiqui is Director of Business Development and New Ventures at the Mayo Clinic, right? Have I got that right? At the Center for Innovation, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, and Sanjay is Senior Program Officer at the California Healthcare Foundation. That sounds just like it sounds. Okay, senior. all right. <laughs> and Laura Deming, Laura's title is obviously founder, but also a partner at the Longevity Fund, which is at longevity.vc, right? Yes. Okay. All right. So I'm going to start by asking each of you to just take a few minutes to describe to the audience so uh, what your organization does. What's, what's your organization's primary mission, right? And then how did you, how did you personally get involved in, the, in healthcare investing? And how does the, the investing part relate back to the primary mission? So Mustakim, why don't you start? Yeah, thanks. So basically, many of you have heard of Mayo Clinic. It's a large multi-specialty multi group practice based in Rochester, Minnesota. Three campuses, Minnesota, Arizona, Florida. 150 years of existence, and basically our primary business line is patient care. And we're really good at very complex patient care, <coughs> um, multi-specialty, things that require a lot of expertise. We do a lot of research as well, and our third shield, which is part of our logo, is actually education. So we also have a medical school. Um, my personal story in getting into healthcare investing and, and part of what I do is basically I'm a physician. I'm an oncologist, hematologist. I basically treat patients with blood cancers. And I realized I really needed a, another skill set. There's so many things that are changing within healthcare that will change during my career, my lifetime, that I either ride the wave or I get crushed by it. <laughs> and so I realized I need another skill set. I needed to think about not only just patient care, but I need to think about how I can improve or facilitate better patient care, lower cost, same or better quality. And um, I got involved with the Center for Innovation. Um, and at the Center for Innovation at Mayo, our main goal is to completely rethink the way we deliver health care. And our vision is 20 years, 30 years down the road. And actually, I sit up here, and, and I have a challenge for all of you. I know that I'm in Silicon Valley. Um, I saw a Tesla with a license plate that said innovate. Um, <laughs> I, and, I, and I know that disrupt is a, is a great catch word, but I, I, I sit up here and I want to challenge you. I want to dare each and every one of you to transform healthcare. Innovation and disruption are great, but we really completely need to look at healthcare in a different way. We need to transform it. And that's exactly what Center for Innovation is, is set to do. We basically look inside the Mayo Clinic and we say, this isn't the way we should be doing this in 10 to 20 years. There has to be a better way. We use design thinking. We use uh, user experience uh, designers. We use industrial designers to look at the actual interactions patients have with the healthcare system and design solutions around them. And, and so what kinds of investing have you done so far? And uh, Mayo is an investor in the institutional sense and has been for a long time, but now it's getting into a uh, much more cutting edge type of investing, looking for actual startups, some of them actually spin-offs of technology being developed at Mayo, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. So if you think about any uh, medical facility, they will have different skills and abilities. And we know at Mayo Clinic we have collected minds, we have collected uh, skills, we have collected intellectual property. So Aside from patient care, how do we take those assets and actually increase the revenue that comes back into the institution? And you know, there's a lot of healthcare economics behind what we do and, and how we look at investing. But ultimately, we want to be able to continue providing the quality care that we provide in an environment where we could actually say, you know what, we have no revenue from patient care. All of our care is funded either through research or through um, 
uh, research grants or through business activities that feed back into actually taking care of patients. Okay, so is this yet a revenue generating activity for you guys? Uh, it depends on which version you talk about. So if you think about the different business arms at Mayo Clinic um, that are not patient related, we have Mayo Clinic Ventures who have our intellectual property portfolio. So they're able to license out our property, they're able to create joint ventures, and they are able to co-invest into other companies that utilize Mayo Clinic skills and knowledge, algorithms, assets. And so yes, um, we've been able to start many companies and our ventures guys will be able to rattle off statistics for you, but yes, that revenue is coming back into the institution and it is helping us uh, as, a, as a revenue stream. Okay, great. We'll come back and talk more about what you're up to and what kinds of companies you've invested in or with. Uh, let's move on, though, at the moment to Sanjay and let you talk a little bit about the California Healthcare Foundation. So not everyone in this audience might uh, be familiar w with w the basic mission of the foundation. So why don't you start there and then talk about how the foundation evolved to sort of uh, uh, investing operation as well. So California Healthcare Foundation, CHCF, not CHF, because that's a whole different uh, acronym, right? Um, but formed in 1996, private philanthropy. Within CHCF, there's the notion of the triple bottom line. So access, quality, and cost is what we're focusing on. And it's really laser focused at the delivery of healthcare. So many folks today and in this room think about direct to consumer as one form of delivery of healthcare. And I think we might be up a little bit in terms of a level and thinking about the engagement still that happens more formally between um, the system, the healthcare system and the patient, whether that may be the physical location, teleservices, telehealth, but not yet at the point of pure direct to consumer, knowing that that's where a lot of things will go, but it's, we're just not there yet. Uh, within CHCF, I'm with the Innovations for the Underserved program. So that's one of four programs, and it sounds just like, like what it means, which is we're looking at solutions and innovations for underserved populations, which were underinsured, uninsured, um, Medicaid or Medi-Cal if you're here, rural areas, low income, and thinking about the providers for those patient populations who sometimes don't benefit from the structure that you're able to set up at like Mayo or Cleveland Clinic and have to fight different types of fires. And so how do we look at getting them access to innovations and technologies for their patient populations? Sometimes very different behavioral sets. So diabetes may be um, diabetes for the entire population set, but it may be a little bit different from those coming from underserved settings and what they can do with solutions, both patients and providers versus non-underserved or more commercial settings. And so I, that's a roundabout way of kind of what we do on a daily basis. The fund that we're using um, uh, within CHCF called the Health Innovation Fund is money that we normally would have uh, granted. And so instead of granting, we've kind of taken this point of, we're learning quite a bit over 16 years now plus, and, you know, 16 years, I've not been there for all 16, obviously at 19 I think I still thought I would be an MBA, power forward, uh, but yeah, I didn't grow anymore, but uh, no, I, th I think the point is, um, you know, six to eight companies over three years, $10 million was an experiment. And it was an opportunity for us to learn that not only can we take what we learned from grants and all the barriers and problems and issues, as well as things that have scratched the surface of what could work, but then if you find the entrepreneur who can leverage that information, that knowledge, and has this um, social component into their business woven in, either from point zero, because they've got a business or solution targeted for this market, or later downstream that they've become more commercial and now want to come back from private health pay and Medicare and want to look at Medicaid. And you, that's an opportunity for us to partner and help spur innovation in that space. So do the organizations that you invest in, uh, are they by definition um, groups that you've been uh, funding on a grant making basis and getting to know them that way before you ever invest? Um, not always. Not always. So, you know, I'll give you two quick case studies, right? So okay. on, on both sides. Um, direct dermatology is a teledermatology service. Uh, you take a picture, you send it over their HIPAA compliance site, they review it within 48 hours, they send you the consult. That's a group that kind of understanding the need for dermatology services was grant work that we had done not with them and a little bit with them before giving them a seed investment. And, the value of impact here is the seed investment, you know, a quarter of a million dollars within nine months, 
um, saw more patients. So more patients got access to care than our historical grant work over three years, you know, we're the tune of two and a half million dollars. On the other side, take a look at something like iRhythm. Um, iRhythm is a full-fledged company. Many of you guys know about it. It's a halter monitor uh, replacement, band-aid form factor. You know, you can wear it for two weeks and mail in the results, and they have the service on the back end. There was no grant work there that was done before, but the investment at this stage in the company is to say, you know, here's a million and a half dollars to uh, bring your efforts into the Medicaid setting, understand the value you can bring to Medicaid, um, you know, it's interesting, we know a lot about how to create innovation within the Medicare setting, right? The code, reimbursement, the structure, not as much in Medicaid. And so the investment allows um, us to learn about that holistically for more than just that investment. But in addition to that, the company gets the benefit of seeing a different target market and the investors in the company are, are happy, right? Their venture capital and their returns aren't going for this effort, but it's great that someone else's is and isn't gonna dilute what they're trying to bring into that. All right, great. Thanks for the intro, Sanjay. Okay, Laura, can you fill us in about your background in, in science and specifically in the science of longevity and how you, you've been a Teal Fellow, right? And yeah, so, yeah. So is this sort of the, out, the outcome of your year as a Teal Fellow? Well, actually, I mean, so I, I can tell you, I've been really interested in this space since I was a kid. I started working in Cynthia Kenyon's lab when I was 12. Um, so I have a very, like, deep personal interest in this space. But I think what's more interesting is actually the space itself. So what is aging and why is it interesting to invest in now? So if you think about the history of cancer, right? Cancer was something that we kind of knew about for, you know, ever since the Greeks came up with the word carcanos, which is crab, which, you know, cancer kind of looked like a crab when you looked at a tumor. Um, and, but we, we didn't really know how to treat it, except for surgery, you know, cutting it out, until like the late 1800s. And we came up with this idea of radiotherapy to treat cancer. And that was really the first time we thought about a non-surgical approach to treating cancer. You know, like 1926, I think, was the first epidemiological paper on cancer. And, and then there was this rapid fire, like, increase in progress in this area of cancer that we never even thought out about before as a species that led up to, like, the 1971 war on cancer um, decision, right? So it's this actually, like, 80-year-old, it's a really, really young disease. And already it makes up, like, the majority of our medical spending, right? Like, uh, I think it's approximately 100 billion, I mean, market numbers are kind of squishy, but, like, 100 billion bucks, you know, one-tenth of our pharma industry is going to cancer. It's like 80-year-old disease. And that's actually really interesting because no one, you know, in 1900 would have thought to say cancer is going to dominate the biotech industry in like, you know, 2000. And so what I think is really interesting is, you know, where, where, where could the next area like this be? Well, if you think about the top 10 U.S. diseases, the majority of them, almost all of them, increase in prevalence with age. You know, heart, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, it, all of these things are related to, to the passage of time. And we've always just dismissed that as something that must be, something that was just kind of a factor of life, right? Um, but if you think about it, if you actually consider aging itself as something, as a process, as, as some kind of thing that we can think about, understand, and study, then that correlation becomes hugely interesting. And the idea that you could target one process to get at all those diseases becomes really, really compelling. Um, and so the thing that actually moved me when I was like the, the actual thing, I mean, I felt, so when I was eight, I, you know, my, uh, I was hanging out with my grandma and I realized that she was, you know, at this age where she was physiologically constrained from enjoying life as much as I did and that was a problem and so I felt the need. But the reason that I actually entered an aging lab and felt compelled to work in the space was reading a Scientific American article, I remembered very clearly, um, about how Cynthia Kenyon made a worm live twice as long as normal with one genetic mutation. And that's actually really interesting. Think about it, you can just change one gene in an organism and, and make it live a healthy life, but twice as long as normal. That's so weird, that shouldn't be the case, but it is. And the fact that that's been scientifically, you know, replicated to the point where we're now making these worms live 10 times as long as normal with single genetic mutations is so unexpected and striking that that formed the basis for about six years of work in the lab, which then led to starting the fund. I mean, look, if aging were a stock index on the public markets, I'd invest in that. Like, I wouldn't, you know, where, wherever is the space to start participating in this area of biology, that's where I want to be. And after a bit of lab work that turned out to be actually taking the work that we were doing, you know, that was mature enough out of the lab and onto the commercial process, 
because there was a relatively um, sort of underrepresented segment of the commercial work that was actually dedicated to aging technologies. So that's why I think aging is an interesting area. And so I run a small venture fund that invests um, specifically and only in companies that target the aging process to treat disease. So your investing thesis is that if you can find companies that can figure out how to treat this disease of aging, uh, almost automatically you're going to be, you know, mega rich at some point uh, because everybody wants to live forever. Well, so, so the, I mean, a lot of people think about the space and they say, well, obviously it's impossible for you to live 120 or 130 or 150 years after taking a pharmaceutical drug, a small molecule. And, and that's probably the case. I mean, honestly, a lot of the current approaches that we have to making drugs are, are pretty dirty and, and vastly bad, right? Like, we, we all recognize that like small molecules, antibodies, vaccines, these are cogent approaches to start making incremental, you know, changes to the health span of a patient, but they're not going to be the final cure to any um, disease that's as complex as what you can imagine Aiden could be. So the first things that we hope to back will be things that incrementally improve the health span of a patient or specifically affect one aging disease. That, that's the first set of goals. But then after that, there's this idea that you can start to develop new modalities of making therapeutics that will then lead to actually affect lifespan in some significant, or health span, not lifespan, sorry, health span's very controversial um, term sort of switch there, in a very significant way. And so that's what we're focused on is like, you know, the 50 to 100 year goal. All right, can you just uh, briefly describe how the fund is set up? Uh, where are the, uh, who are the LPs? Um, what kinds of investing are you gonna do? What kind of cycle will you, are you, are you actually interviewing companies already? Um, yeah, yeah, so it, um, it was actually an interesting process. We have a small circle of high net worth LPs. Um, these very sophisticated investors, though. We're very happy to have the kind of investors that we have on board. Uh, it took about two years to raise the fund, um, and it was a lot of hustling at the beginning, um, and a lot of telling people about this idea, and then finding companies that fit the profile, and then going back to the original investors and saying, you know, here's the science, and here's the data. And you know, you can be afraid of taking a risk, and that's fine, but you have to understand that you know, there's this much done, and then here's the risk that you'd be taking if you made the investment. Um, and so that whole process took about two years to set up, but the fund's now up and running. Um, it's, it's got a really good team behind it. Um, I, I worked with several venture funds for the two years that I was raising the fund and have a lot of great relationships in the venture industry. So, uh, and we've been investing already, so. We're relatively stealth at this point. We don't talk a lot about what we do, because I think it's an area that's prone to hype, and if you, start hyping early, especially in biotech. I mean, look at sequencing, right? You're gonna get bitten 10 years down the line. Um, but I, I think that there are some really great companies out there and we've been lucky enough to be part of some of them. Okay, well, maybe starting with Laura and then coming back in this direction. I'd like to each of you to maybe speak a little bit about how your type of investing um, contrasts with more traditional venture investing. Um, a lot of uh, venture firms won't get involved in a company until um, there's some proof of uh, a market traction. Um, often, you know, uh, the, the big Sand Hill Road firms are making later stage investments. You guys are coming from the perspective of a small fund or from the perspective of a nonprofit. Does that put you in a position to complement or f fill in some of the gaps, perhaps, um, left by the traditional venture investing system? And is that part of the uh, design of, of your fund? So, Laura, do you want to start? Yeah, I'll, I'll just say quickly, we have two, I think, main components that differentiate our strategy. One is focusing on actual health span extension as a proof of concept marker for the companies that we invest in. I think in biology, one major concern is the lack of cogent proof of concept in the preclinical space. Um, this is, a, you know, the fact that you can drown a mouse, see how long it takes to actually die in the water, and then mark that as a measure of how depressed it is as a proof of concept for a clinical, you know, drug for depression, is, it's not a great state of the affairs of our mouse model um, community, but what is great about aging is that taking a wild type mouse and making it live longer is actually extraordinarily difficult. It's really gnarly, because you're reversing every generic process that the mouse experiences. And so if you have that proof of concept, that means something very different, I think, than stuffing a mouse's brain full of A-beta protein and saying, hey, look, we cured Alzheimer's by giving it A-beta antibody that's specific to a mouse. I, mean, I think that's a crazy way to do um, biology and call that a, a proof of concept for Alzheimer's nonetheless. Um, but so our companies, um, we focus on the proof of concept of health span extension because we think it's really strong and differentiated. Um, and the other component to what we do is we put a lot of time when I was starting the fund and going out to pharma companies, going out to investors, you know, going out to all the people in healthcare that we respected and saying, what do you think about aging? You know, what would it take for you to invest in this space? You know, where would you syndicate or where would you partner? And so now we have that network and we keep it alive 
and we help companies that we invest in interact with that network. And so I think that's the other very specific differentiated part of our strategy. Sanjay, what can the foundation do that a traditional venture firm wouldn't be able to do? Yeah, well, let me start with saying that our venture friends still do invest in ideas. Um, so I don't want, I know there's this trend in movement towards later stage proof of concept, but they do still have interest there. And the reason I bring highlight to that is as a nonprofit um, making these program related to mission related investments, we're, we're not investing on the napkin. We're not looking at that. We're looking at a tested prototype of some sort that's got some, uh, some, some data, some trend that we believe with our investment, we're going to help them grow and scale and impact. And so, you know, at the end of the day, one of the major differences and why it kind of makes sense for us to be an early stage investor at that seed to series A is the return. The return for us isn't financial. The return for us is impact. And so whenever we make an investment, we're looking at one of two levers. Is this a solution that's going to create access to care for 100,000 Californians? And or is this a solution that's going to create a savings across California healthcare systems of $25 million? And so when we structure the investment, the rates, you know, if it's a debt instrument, a convertible note, um, we haven't done equity yet, not to say that we won't, but those rates um, tied to the financial terms aren't uh, asking for, for venture rates or venture debt rates. And so we kind of come in to, again, help the company do what it needs to do at the early stage so that it probably can go out and talk to Laura or Mayo or Morgan Thaler or Aberdeer and talk about how they can get additional financing to finish it up. And I should also say, I think when you're, when you're kind of focused in a space, you're a little bit different. You find out what's your box a little bit. And so, you know, we realize we're not putting in more than $3 million over three years into any single investment. And so if you think about that, then we said, all right, well, devices and pharma, for the most part, are off the table because they're gonna require much more capital for that, for, to be successful. So if there is a device, um, and we've invested in a couple, but the device actually is part of a bigger service component, and that's the service play for us in HIT and services, and where a lot of folks are here um, you know, are, are interested in, is, is where we understand our one to three million dollar investment will make the most impact to help them gain uh, market traction, data, uh, customers, uh, other investors, you know, you name it. Um, I think the one thing you guys, it, it's really interesting. I don't know if you, she heard, she said two years was a long time. And I think that's great, because if you think about uh, the folks of us that are here, two years sometimes might see like, you know, that's, that sounds like it was reasonable to create a fund, but I can tell you're like amped and you're ready, you know, so. Um, and the other thing is, is that I need to start talking like she does so I can get more fuel points, because <laughs> this is not, <laughs> not gonna get me that many sitting in the chair all day long. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you can stand up and jump up and down so while you talk. <laughs> yeah. Oh, nice bracelet, by the way, Laura. Yeah. yeah. Oh, everyone should get a shine. They are awesome. I totally agree. <laughs> All right. Uh, at Mayo, you guys are, to some extent, you're looking inward at what's going on at Mayo. So that's one thing that makes you different right off the bat. But in, in what other ways are you guys able to do stuff that maybe a traditional Sand Hill Road firm would not be able to do? So of course, you know, our assets include the knowledge and skills and, and quite honestly, when it comes to investment, we really like to lead with the opportunities of pairing our knowledge and skills with other companies. And when it makes sense then, then to follow up also with, you know, financial assistance. And so I, I think that that makes us fundamentally different. We, we at Mayo have a vision of touching 200 million lives per year by 2020. So any place where we can put our knowledge and skills in a company's hands or work with a company to get to 200 million lives per, uh, by 2020 per year, um, that is very interesting to us. Anything that fundamentally changes the way that um, patients experience delivery of healthcare is, is something that we lead with. And of course, we're always looking for ways to decrease operational cost. And so any software platforms are, that are in the startup space that we think we can bring in and decrease the cost of care overall um, are, are ideas that we like to lead with. Okay, Anna, how are we doing on time? Do we have time for Q&A? Yeah. All right, great. Let's open it up to the audience. So this is your chance to, to ask these panelists about their approach to investing, maybe uh, what kinds of things they like to see in a pitch, for example. That'll be my question if nobody else has one. Um, raise your hand.
Yep, so Esther is just asking you to quantify this. How big is your fund and what kinds of investments are you looking to make? Sort of how large would each investment be and how many follow-on rounds, that kind of thing? Yeah, so at Mayo, we don't actually have a fund set aside in terms of we have, say, $20 million that we need to invest by a certain date. What we look at is the opportunity and we look at investing between half a million to about three to four million uh, per deal. Um, as summary, so we put in about half a million to a million in the initial investment in a solution. We reserve, in a, in a sense, up to three million over three years. And in total, the first experiment, if you will, for us was 10 million over three years in six to eight companies. And we're about to wrap up our third year and sure enough, we're about to close two more deals and get to 10 million. And the next set for us is to do, um, as we're talking with our decision makers and our board, to continue doing actually more of the same, and if not, maybe even a little bit more in these efforts. Because these are, again, like I said, a subset of what we would have been granting out anyways. And the extent as a grant maker, uh, if any of you heard my CEO talk before, you, you make a grant and the money goes away. Um, you make an investment and there's a chance it may come back, and then that's the whole notion of recycling so that we can find a few more solutions to put money into. So we have a specific investment size. We're 300K into a company's first round, um, and we're looking to do six to eight companies over the next couple of years. And have you publicly said how much, how much money you raised, how big the fund is? No, it, we're potentially doing a second close at the end of the year to next year, so maybe then we'll announce, but. Okay. Yes. Other questions from the audience? No? So uh, let me ask you guys. Um, do you have any advice for uh, what kinds of healthcare companies should think about pitching each of you, first of all? And um, do you have any sort of advice about uh, you know, pluses and minuses, uh, pros and, uh, things to do and things not to do in a pitch deck? So I had a really awesome experience um, in Boston a month ago. An entrepreneur was pitching me. It was like a 15-minute conversation. And I was like, you know, so where's this data? Like, where's this data? Like, do you have lifespan data for this worm, for this mouse? And he just handed me a data card with literally every piece of data I could ever ask for on the card. And that was awesome. Because, like that, like, that was it. Like, it was, like, 15-minute conversation and then, like, all the data. And that's, like, because that, all, that's all you want to ask about. Um, and that just made the process so much simpler. I was like, this is an awesome idea. If people could just do this for every healthcare investment, make, like, everyone's life easier. But what was great about, what was the, what was the coolest thing about that? Was it that you didn't have to talk about the data and you could instead talk about more important things like, like, who are these people? <laughs> are, you know, are they really smart? Do well, I want I mean, to work with them? You, you get to know the person, but then, like, look, I mean, it takes, like, you know, you know, maybe five hours to go through data, really understand what was done in each experiment, you know, compare it to published literature, understand the quality of the experiment. Um, and you don't want to just, you know, have to write someone to get all that, set up a data room and all of that. You just want to walk away from a meeting and be able to immediately look through all the things that you've been talking about at a high level. And having that in hand was just a really nice kind of um, event that I'd never experienced before. And I thought this is a great thing for entrepreneurs to do if they have data in some kind of form that they can capture. Okay, there's a stick. great tip for you guys. Sanjay, do you have any sort of favorite memories of great pitches? Uh, well, I, I will say, I mean, when you're a part of this community, there's no such thing as a bad pitch. Like, there are, there are versions of bad pitches, but not the bad pitch. So I think all of us are open to people coming up to us and talking to us about their concept. Because if it's not us, part of our responsibility is to say, well, who else should it be? And so CHCF is not the right investor for you, but you have a good team, you have a good idea, a good notion. You know, who else should I be calling up and introducing you to? Because that's, that's the way the network works. I'll say um, understanding who you're talking to. So if you come to us, uh, probably any one of us, and you're looking for just a pure uh, investor, you know, a financial relationship, we probably aren't the best person to talk to because there's something more than that. So if there's an impact, you know, you understand impact with respect to access to care, cost savings, and you're attempting to put your story in that format so that we can talk about that, you may be an efficiency play, a revenue generator, but if you don't understand the impact that I need to drive because that's part of our mission, then there's a disconnect there. So you'll probably hear me ask you the same question and get you back to that, and then it just may turn out that's not the focus of your company, but that conversation or that instance and connection could still lead to us helping you introduce you to someone else who could help you. Okay, and, and Mustakim, what's like the perfect pitch at Mayo? Well, I mean, if you have some preliminary data to actually tell me 
um, what is the uptake of your product or what is the use case of your product. That's very helpful. Uh, and then the second piece is when you have data that's not so flattering, have an answer. So I'll give you a great example. Um, I was talking to a company that um, would tell me, you know, we, we get, you know, 10,000 unique visitors per month. And okay, well, that's great. What's your six month retention rate? It's 1%. Then there's silence, right? That silence needs to be explained a little bit. So if I'm working with you, I want to understand what do you have in mind that's going to take that retention rate up? Because so far, all I know is you know how to generate registrations. You haven't figured out how to continue with engagement. So those are, those are pieces of data that I think are, are pretty important. I, I think one more thing I'll, I'll, I'll add is, is that one of the common mistakes entrepreneurs make is that they really spend a lot of time on the idea. I get the idea. But what I really want to know is the, the business nuts and bolts. What's your distribution strategy? What's your marketing strategy? Um, those are key pieces that I need to know or at least understand that you know so that I can make a stronger case for working with your team. And, and I think the idea, everybody loves the idea. I love it too. but. I really need the nuts and bolts from a business standpoint. Okay, I want to piggyback just on yeah. that. I, th I think that's a great point. A lot of times entrepreneurs will spend a lot of time around the need or the idea and the market. And I, I would almost put those as background slides. And if you could quickly tell you, you know, that story, you know, we say, right, is this a story you could tell your grandmother, not the astrophysicist grandmother, the other one, right? The one that is going to understand it really quickly, and then we can get to the nuts and bolts of the operations and that you understand this market and going forward, so. All right, great. So thank you to our panel. This has been terrific. You should all stick around for the Steve Blank discussion, because that's going to be amazing. He's so interesting and funny, and, and he's right there. So I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> all right, thank you so much, Laura, Sanjay, Mr. King. Thanks.